Welcome to Sisters in Crime Australia and Murder Mondays, when authors talk about their crime craft. I'm Karina Kilmore, a debut crime writer, a journalist and a national convener for Sisters in Crime, and we've been celebrating women's crime writing since 1991. Before I introduce Emma Viskic, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. Emma, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for being with us and congratulations again on being a joint winner of the 2020 David Award for Reader's Choice. Thank you so much. I'm so excited about that. Actually, it adds to an already impressive collection of awards and recognition for Emma. Um, Emma, your debut novel, Resurrection Bay, uh, the first of the Caleb Zalek series was shortlisted for the UK's prestigious gold dagger and its new blood dagger, while in the US it was shortlisted for a Barry Award. And you have also won a Ned Kelly Award and a record five Sisters in Crime David Awards. Before we get to the questions, can you please give us your elevator pitch for Darkness for Light? Anyone who knows me will know that I'm spectacularly bad at an elevator pitch, including my publishers, <laughs> but I'll have a go. So Darkness for Light is the third novel in the Caleb Zellick uh, series. Um, it's a few months after the second novel um, and fire came down. Caleb is trying to get his life back in order. He's reconnecting with the deaf community. He's almost reunited with his beloved almost ex-wife cat um, and he's he's really trying to make good decisions he's got a new motto make good decisions uh, and that of course all goes out the window um, as soon as a potential client turns up dead and he's drawn back into the world of his ex-business partner Frankie and when her niece is kidnapped things pretty much go downhill from there so darkness and light <laughs> I love that new motto. <laughs> Make good decisions. <laughs> yeah. That might, that might be personally inspired. <laughs> Why is crime so appealing as a genre? To me personally, as a writer and a reader, I think it's because it can do everything. So I, I read widely. I read all, all genres. But crime has this ability to be both entertaining and provoke thought. Uh, so I, I really like books that can be quite personal. So that's usually where you have the detective. Um, and so you get that the, the inner thoughts, their emotions, you go on a journey with them. But at the same time, you're exploring things that are important to you or important the work to the world that you live in. So whether that's about racism or, or violence or um, even just the way people come to make decisions in their life. Um, I think crime just has this absolute um, unique ability to shine a spotlight on those different things. So um, it hits that sweet spot between the personal and, and the larger world, really. So whether, whether I'm writing it or I'm reading it, um, I do love books that, that can get both that, that balance between those two things. Yeah. How do you um, write violence? Very easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's, it's quite interesting. I think I do have quite a violent streak. <laughs> like, I, I'm a very emotional person. So I've often said that I'm a good, ac uh, a good argument for why guns should be banned in Australia. Um, because I, I can actually imagine hitting out in anger. Um, having said that, I've never been physically violent, but, but it's just that mental you know, response to things. And, and I think the older I get, the more I can relate to it as well. You know, I, I, have, um, I have children now and, and I can absolutely imagine myself doing something to protect them. Whereas I think when I was younger, the thought is if I was cornered in a dangerous situation, what would I do? Well, the first instinct might not have necessarily been to fight back but whereas now I can go yep totally would um, so it's quite easy for me to imagine being in a situation where someone needs to fight to defend themselves or def defend um, the people they love um, 
In terms of the technique, I think it's when I get a visceral reaction to what I'm writing. So I need to feel a bit breathless. I need to feel that my pulse is up. I mean, and all my writing is quite visceral anyway. That's sort of how I get into things. Um, it's short sentences. It's um, really truncated thoughts. It's, it's that sensation of reacting rather than thinking things through. And I think that's also why I write Caleb's character the way he is, because he is someone who tends to dive into action you know, very, very quickly without thinking things through. And, and he's trying to change that, hence the make good decisions. Um, so writing violence through his eyes comes quite easily because he has got that instant physical reaction to things. Um, and although he might be trying to think things through, I won't write long sentences where I'm going, well, the man's standing over there. Therefore, if I have to do this, this will happen. He's, he's an um, instant, instant action sort of guy. Yeah. Oh, great. Would you write a crime book about the pandemic? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy, that answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's been really interesting. When you go through such a big and linked event where everyone in the world is going through this in sometimes different ways, sometimes very mm. similar ways, it's very hard to get a new outlook on it. I mean, we're all, I, I think, either so immersed in it that we don't want to read anything more about it, or we're trying to get our heads away from it. Um, I imagine there's going to be some great books written about the pandemic. I'm hoping they're not going to be for quite a few years, though. I think it's, it's too soon. We need to sort of, yeah. you know, um, we need to sit and, and, and think about it a little bit. Funnily enough, uh, I'm writing the next Caleb book at the moment and part of the setting is in an old quarantine hospital. And I chose this setting about four years ago. It's based on, well, like Meg Mundell. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's based on the old Nepean quarantine hospital. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't believe it when the pandemic happened. And I've had to sort of take bits out because it's all, I've got all words like virus and infection in the book and I've had to tone them down a bit because I think it's just a little bit a little bit too soon yeah who are your literary inspirations oh so that's such an interesting question and my answer usually changes from day to day yeah. um I've always been a huge reader ever since I first started reading I've been a big reader and at various stages it's been whoever I've been reading. So, you know, if I go way back, it was Seven Little Australians and Anna Blight and everything. But I think where things really, I started really um, thinking differently about books in that I wasn't just enjoying whatever I was reading, but I was really thinking, oh, this is a book I love. Back when I was an early teenager, we go back to um, all sorts of books from Naya Marsh and Ian Fleming yeah. to Jane Austen and Charles Dickens. Uh, I was given the sort of run of my parents' bookshelf when I was, you know, 10, 11 or so, and, and I read everything. Um, so there's a real mix of books. Mm -hmm. In more recent years, um, it's been writers like Hilary Mantel, Rachel Cusk, um, Elizabeth Strout, um, writers who really get into the psyche of their characters yeah. and, and take also great uh, joy in the language of writing. And then we've got um, mixed in there writers like Val McDermott, Sarah Peretsky, Peter Temple, um, writers who um, are also a lot more plot oriented, say, than Elizabeth Stroud or Rachel Cusk, mm -hmm. who really have no plot, um, but are still getting into the psyche of their characters whilst delivering a really good story. So they're all mixed in there together and and um yeah you get different things from different writers at, at different stages of my life and particularly in the rereading because I love rereading books yeah yeah that's good who's your favorite character from crime fiction that's like asking to choose a favorite child really oh, no. <laughs> favorites can we do favorites yeah go on <laughs> I have many many favorites um so, okay, so I mentioned Val McDermott. So, you yeah. you know, you've got the Tony Hill, people like that. Mm -hmm. um, closer to home, I love um, J.M. Green, Stella Hardy. Yeah. Um, she's, you know, that she loves her food. She loves her wine. She's got a foul mouth. She's funny, you know. Um, 
and, and of course, you go back to the Sara Paretsky, V.I. Warshawski, mm -hmm. who was actually the first female crime writer I ever read. Um, yeah. Her book, her first book was given to me um, when I was, I don't know, maybe 17, 18, and I'll, it, it blew my brain. It was like, oh, my God, women could be detectives. It, I was so excited. Um, and, I, and I do love uh, Peter Temple's uh, Joe Cashin as well, mm -hmm. um, who's a, he's quite a simple character really in some ways, but um, has those layers to his personality that, that I really like. Um, yeah, gee, I mean, yeah. <laughs> every book I've ever read. <laughs> How do you write about sex? Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. I've only had a couple of sex scenes in my books. Um, I haven't had a problem writing them because not many people read my books before I you know, pass them on to the publishers and then I pretend that no one's ever read them at all. What to write is the interesting one. Like how graphic do you get? That, that, that becomes a really interesting question. So in Resurrection Bay, there is a sex scene, but it's very much you leave it at the door. Mm. You don't actually see the, you know, insert into what and do, who, who's he. Um, and that, because it felt right for the book. So the, what you do see is the emotional lead up to it. And it's because it's about Caleb reconnecting with his ex-wife. It's about... Mm -hmm him going oh is she giving me signals and and him clearly like oblivious to how huge the signals are like mm -hmm. he's he's just a bit slow on the uptake so uh, I think that's the answer is that it the sex scene has to show you something a bit more than the fact that someone's having sex so um in and fire came down it was it's actually a pivotal moment in the book the sex scene mm. so yeah. I wasn't quite sure if I was going to do I'm never sure if I'm going to do a sex scene until I'm writing the book but in fire came down it's an obvious one because uh Caleb and his ex-wife are, are still really not together um and she initiates sex again um and it's a real moment of closeness between them um it's outside it's in the dark on a beach Caleb is deaf so he use a sign language he can't understand her in the dark and so they use something called tactile signing and tactile signing is something I've seen um, done a few times um, and I've been waiting for the right moment to use it and it's it's basically a deaf blind people use it and you you put your hand on the other person's hand and you follow their movements as they sign and you can understand so they tactile sign and I thought it was a, a, a really good way of showing how intimate and how close they are and then showing how terribly he stuffs up at the end of it by shutting down emotionally. So I think sex scenes have to mean more than just a sex scene. Um, and then, of course, you don't show them to your mother. How do you decide the scene of a crime? Literally the scene as in where it's set. Yeah. yeah. I, I really like contrast. So mm -hmm. the beginning of Darkness for Light, I wanted Caleb feeling happy. I wanted it to be one of those really crisp autumn days in Melbourne. So it feels like it's good. It feels like we're in a good place. And I actually played around with a few different settings mentally. I thought, oh, we could do Luna Park or, you know, beach or something. And I thought, no, I think I want it more innocuous than that. So I set it at a children's farm, um, loosely based on the Collingwood children's farm, yeah. because I like the contrast between, the, hey, it's lovely and there are children around and there's, you know, plump cows and here's a dead body. So playing with that, um, the, the, the heavy and the, and the light and the dark and the light um, is, is really good. With... Um, with my first book, with Resurrection Bay, I knew that the opening murder was going to be set somewhere very safe and homey um, because you you don't know the characters when the book opens and I wanted it to be a very personal murder. So I knew that Caleb was going to find his best friend's body in his best friend's home and the kitchen just felt like the obvious place to do it because it's the heart of the home and everything. So I think usually I like to connect the murder to the the to the mood of the book and and also the connection with the character and, yeah. and sometimes for humor as well because I'm a little bit always sick. humor mm. <laughs> what's the best way to dig yourself out of a bad plot hole 
if I find out, I shall tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no good way. <laughs> yeah. Um, taking time, really. Um, and, uh, I mean, I do this all the time because of the, the way I, I write. I am continually writing myself into holes and then I need to sometimes just put a pin in something and go away and do other things. Uh, moving works a lot. So walking, riding, yeah. Um, yeah. I just need to move. If I sit at a computer, I can guarantee I will not come up with the answer. Um, mm -hmm. The best thing about plot holes, though, is sometimes they come up with the best twists and the most interesting ideas. So when you write yourself out of one, um, not always, but quite a lot of the time, that's the, they're the moments where people go, oh, I didn't see that coming. It's like, well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> what started you on a life of crime? <laughs> um, we've mentioned the violence, haven't we? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I actually wrote, I wrote all through my childhood, all through my teen years, um, but it was really without any thought for um, why I was writing. I was just writing. Um, so when I first start, sat down to write a book, um, I, I actually wrote a couple of full length manuscripts. Um, and I loved the process. I really enjoyed doing it. Um, but they were really boring. They were really, really boring. Um, and the aspects that did work in the manuscripts were um, well, sometimes the interpersonal connect connections between characters. Um, but it was mainly when, um, bizarrely enough, something was happening <laughs> rather, than, rather than the characters sitting, talking to each other in cafes, when there was some pressure involved, whether it was a, like a personal pressure or an external pressure, um, that's when the characters started doing interesting things and started um, the, the interest was in their actions and reactions to what was happening. Um, mm -hmm. So that's when I thought, oh, okay, don't just write a book, write a book about something. Um, and crime was the obvious um, solution to that because I've, I've read a lot of crime. I, I, I really enjoy it. And as I was saying before, it gives you such a great opportunity to write about deeper issues so yeah. that's when I sat down and I, I wrote Resurrection Bay then. Yeah, fabulous. Tell us something not in your book about your main character. Oh that's a really interesting one. Um, most of it is either on the page or in subtext. I think I could say um, that he's actually a really bad cook. And that actually never appears on the page. He talks about his wife's cooking. You see him in cafes a lot, but you never actually see him cooking. Um, and it's not that he can't cook. He really just doesn't care about it very much. And for various reasons along the way, that hasn't made it into the manuscripts, either because the scene hasn't worked or it just feels like, one too many things um but he basically he lives on tinned baked beans and takeaway and oh. and other people's <laughs> well he's he's got a good friend uh, who runs the deaf cafe now so he's got some really really good he food has. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> so it, it's definitely there in his life <laughs> how much of a profile do you do for each character before you write none at all <laughs> Absolutely zero. Uh, so all my writing is um, done through the writing. Um, so for, for every book that's published, there's probably another entire book that I've written along the way that gets taken out. Um, so I discover the, write, the, the characters through the writing. Often, um, often I get them talking to each other. So I'll have pages of dialogue of the characters just chatting that's sort of my way into their heads um and that that gets deleted um mm. no it gets saved to a file yes <laughs> with all the other little happy files on the farm um mm. and um and so it, it's it's the way that works best for me it's not an efficient way of doing it but um the idea of trying to create a character before they walk onto the page just doesn't work for me, it just feels a little bit um, manufactured. So it, it does seem to be the only way um, to do it. That one of the main problems is that I then uh, forget to write little notes to myself about what colour 
people's eyes are and you know what their middle name is and so I'm I'm always flicking back through my books to try and you know remember such and such as mother's dog's name um it's yeah it's a bit messy how important is place in your writing yeah pretty important um I don't always start with it so the the crimes the murders as I say I'll have a firm idea of them when I start writing or or soon afterwards. Um, In terms of the streets and the landscape, because the books are set between Melbourne and the the fictional town of Resurrection Bay, Mm. I need to really show how these places are different and and the places um, have different personalities. So with Resurrection Bay, I wanted to show the anonymity of Melbourne and I wanted to show the almost claustrophobic familiarity of a small country town yeah. as well. So that's described in, you know, the, the shops are shutting down in Resurrection Bay and you've got the salt specked windows and that. The streets of Melbourne, and, and I think this probably comes through more in Darkness for Light because Darkness for Light is set in the city almost 100%. Um, you have more of the feeling of the alleyways and the the dark alleyways and the danger corners. And um, quite early in the book, Caleb is thinking that he's being tailed. And in my mind, um, this is up in Coburg where the houses sort of stop and it's light industrial. And to get that feeling of there are people around, but there aren't people around just up the corner. Up the corner, it's going to be dark. It's going to be isolated. No one is going to hear you if you scream. Um, so that sense of place really adds to the the feeling of what's happening in the book. Um, but I often, actually almost always, put these details in later. I, I literally, mm-hmm. in capital letters, say, describe and then go on with the story because <laughs> it takes me a long time to do the setting. Um, and if I get bogged down on that and then decide to change the setting, which I often do, mm-hmm. I have wasted days on on doing it. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of little capital letter instructions to myself through my manuscripts. <laughs> and what's your top writing tip and what's your top self-editing tip? Um, there's, there's a crossover there, which is read your work out loud. Um, mm-hmm. It's, I, I mean, I do that multiple times through through my writing. Um, even I, I can sort of hear it when I write anyway, but I will always pick up more in the reading out loud. You, you will hear if a sentence has got too many words. You'll hear if um, something doesn't make sense. Um, it's absolutely invaluable for dialogue. Yeah. Um, and I know that's slightly ironic because I'm writing a deaf character, but... It's not just the the sound of it, it's the feel of it in your mouth. It's the feel of there's too many syllables, I'm tripping over that sentence. Or also um, that maybe we use sentences of the same length. You know, they're all short or they're all long or they've all got a semicolon. Um, and so you tend to pick that up. Um, apart from that, the, the number one writing tip is um, to find the time and the way that works best for you and don't be worried about how other people do it there's a lot of advice and rules out there about you must do a seven page outline before you start or hey don't worry about outlines just write or you must get up at you know two o'clock in the morning to write um so you've got to find what works for you and obviously you've got to work this around you know family and work and pandemics and everything but as much as you can you hold that time precious, you put a note on the door and you try not to answer emails in that time and you use that time and don't be thinking about how you should be doing it. Think about how it works for you. Yeah, terrific. And our last question today, Emma, how would you get away with murder? <laughs> well, I wouldn't be admitting to it on um, <laughs> an online forum. For for yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think you've you've got to um, make it look like suicide if at all possible Um, but if you can't do that for whatever reason and there's lots of ways of doing that (laughs) if you can't do that don't be burying the body in a shallow grave I mean seriously you've got to have planned what you're doing with the body beforehand you either need to watch Breaking Bad and get an idea of the acids involved or you need to be waiting and dumping something out to see I mean get a bit organized I think is, is the answer to that 
Free organization. Yeah. <laughs> Emma, thank you for being with us on Murder Mondays. Thanks so much for having me.